and welcome to The Gift Show. My guest today is Susan Heaton-Wright. The UK has been going through a period of political turmoil and I think in the, for the, we have the third Prime Minister and Cabinet in the space of seven or eight weeks. And so already Rishi Sunak and his Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, they said that the future, the immediate future, is not too rosy and people can expect increases in taxation and there'll be also spending cuts amongst government, government departments and other public services. So how has this cost living in crisis impacted you, Susan, may I ask? You know, it's a really, really difficult situation. There's no doubt about it in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom and Northern Ireland. And only yesterday I was speaking with one of my clients over in UAE, the United Emirates. Very and good. She, and she said, oh, my goodness, what's going on there? Is it really awful? And yes, we are in a terrible crisis, which was caused by the reaction to that mini budget at the beginning of the Indeed. previous um the previous prime minister's um her reign and um it's going to take an awful lot to fill that hole of money that was spent stopping the markets completely collapsing and in particular pensions being impacted by this and interestingly enough, there was an article in the Irish Times there uh, during the week. I'll start again. Interestingly yes. enough, there was an article in the Sunday Times recently. And what the, the author of the article said was that the central banks, whether it's the Bank of England, the ECB, or the Federal Reserve Board in the United States, they have contributed to this inflationary pressure because during the last say number of years there was quantitative easing and the central banks in those countries and across europe they printed money galore to get people to spend more money and to boost domestic ex expenditure in economies that has contributed to the inflationary pressure in addition to say these lockdowns you have in china and consequent supply chain issues and also we're coming out of the COVID period now where there was a lot of money put into the economy to keep industry turning its wheels I suppose you could say. What have you been hearing from your clients about inflationary pressure within their businesses or within their personal lives? It's interesting because my clients aren't really talking about that yet. Maybe the types of conversations that I have with them are differing um but obviously i'm talking to friends and family members and reading the media i'm trying to filter the amount that i hear from the media because if you read the times every day we're doomed and possibly we are but we can get impacted by that in a negative way and it can make us fearful and could impact on our own businesses True, I know what you're saying there, that if you take on too much negative comment or thought into your mind, you're taking your eye off the crucial issue within your business, which is to help and serve your customers to the best of your ability and to put out their good quality intellectual content and intellectual property. So I think it's important to look after your own well-being and those of your clients and try and steer the conversation in a positive direction rather than talking about negative issues all the time so you have to filter out as you quite correctly say a lot of this media content because otherwise you become a gloom and doom merchant in your own way and you know that just puts people off what advice do you have for the average family who's struggling to uh, meet ends or the vulnerable in our society so if you take the average family they could have a mortgage a car loan they have children in school, they have, you know, Christmas is coming, they're trying to put food on the table for Christmas, buy Christmas presents, in addition to pay their mortgage, or, you know, pay car loans, pay their electricity bill, their gas bill. What advice do you have for those people? 
you know it, it's not exclusively those things there's also petrol which has gone up massively in the United Kingdom. Now, I'm not sure if it's the same in, in Ireland, but certainly over here. And where I live, it's at least 10p a litre more than in other parts of the country. They obviously think that this is a an affluent area and will pay when that's a bit naughty. But, you know, I think we all have to look at our budgets I know from from reading the media uh, that more people are being very savvy about where they shop for food and they're no longer going with luxury brands, but own brands of Tesco, Sainsbury's, all of those. Certainly from my point of view, we shop more in Aldi. I always cook from fresh anyway. Very good. So the ingredients are there. And Aldi is a little bit cheaper than Waitrose. Both of those are brands in the United Kingdom. Um, and thinking about when we go out, I, I'm already thinking about, do I need to take the car? So um, I have an option of working 12 miles away in a sort of one, one of those areas where you can be with other people working. And I think, well, that's a 24 mile journey back there and back. Is it worth my while doing that? Because how much will that cost in fuel? It might sound trivial, but when you do that a couple of times a week, it's going to impact on my budget. True. And I was just saying there, Susan, that, you know, 24 hour, sorry, 24 mile round trip five times a week that's 120 miles before you know it that's going to cost you money in terms of putting fuel in your car also wear and tear on your car when it comes to its next absolutely. service absolutely and certainly our family we are we have switched off radiators in rooms that we don't use um we're trying to keep the um heating off and wear an extra jumper we bought a couple of um door stops um to stop the the um the air coming through so that to prevent drafts i know it sounds really silly but things like that can make a difference that's a very good point there susan i know what you're saying there that uh, you know if you just take the greater london area that we're both aware of and we have what's called really, I suppose you could say, a double storm, because there's a need for a lot of people in the, in the greater London area to invest in retrofitting their homes. Now, we're in an inflationary period. The cost of materials has shot to the roof to do all that yes. work. And while you're waiting to get your house retrofitted, you have to look very carefully at how you can heat your house in an economical way and as you say there there's no point having the gas on 24 7 because you know if your house is poorly insulated for example you're going to get a lot of heat loss pretty quickly it's going to cost you money to heat that house so you have to look at alternative ways perhaps you have to buy electric heaters and use yeah. them in your home office in your living room in your kitchen throughout the daytime and then you put your gas heating on maybe first thing in the morning for an hour and maybe for an hour or two at night so that's an, an ideal way to look at saving energy and reducing your gas bill and keeping costs down have you noticed if you're meeting clients say for example in central london any increases in the cost you know of buying coffees uh, oh goodness me yes all of those things have gone up um you know everybody would go out pre-pandemic they would nip out to get a coffee from one of the the coffee stores it would be in a plastic cup or if they were good enough they took their own cups um, for environmental purposes what was two pounds fifty you're looking at four pounds now now, for some people, that's part of their everyday life, but certainly more people, myself included, are thinking, well, you know, that's an add on. I'll wait until I get home and make myself a cup of tea instead. 
it's all it's all thinking about these things and these little things all add up don't they they do indeed whether it's your business or whether it's um your your personal income and just going back to the supermarkets there and i'm aware having lived in the uk myself of waitrose sainsbury's tesco's and then shortly after i left the uk the likes of Lidl and aldi entered those big german discount stores yes and they have achieved quite a decent market share between the two of them over the last say 20 odd years <laughs> are people shopping around to get the best of both worlds is what you're they, saying they definitely are and um and we have a, a an aldi close by and we do know from speaking to suppliers that the suppliers that supply for Aldi, the fruit and vegetables, also do to the other um, supermarkets. It's exactly the same, different price. Well, interesting enough now. Yeah. So the some supermarkets are putting a price or premium on vegetables or you know raw foods. They want a higher margin. Yes. Probably offering savings in other products. So you have to be Super. conscientious shopper. <laughs> Are you okay there? Yeah, you do. yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. yeah, you have to be really, really careful and, and savvy about these things. Um, and it's the same with your business as well. Yeah. And also there, I just noticed there recently uh, in the UK, uh, if you take, for example, you're living in the home counties, you're heavily dependent on using trains to get yeah. to and from London if you're meeting clients in, you know, in the city or you know anywhere in west central london west end for example and you've had train strikes now the unions are looking for substantial pay increases for train drivers what's going to happen there eventually is if they get those pay increases that's going to be passed on to the consumer in terms oh. of increased train fares has there been any you know what's the impact of these strikes on the consumer Impossible. Oh, it, it, you know, it it really infuriates me because during the pandemic, the government gave a huge amount of support to the railways and and also to the London Underground as well, um, London Transport. Yes. And I do know I have one or two clients that are within the transport industry and they are trying to make things more efficient for the 21st century, bringing in more technology. And that means to say that some people will need to be redeployed elsewhere. Um, and this means that people will lose jobs, but hopefully get redeployed in, in another area. And we have to move forward. And it is so infuriating when you see that that the real re that the the rail drivers they earn huge amounts of money they have a really really good salary for semi skilled workers you know they're semi skilled they are not they're not trained up like doctors or accountants they're semi skilled and yes, I do understand that what they're partly doing that for is to represent those people that are less well paid. Perhaps they are conductors mm -hmm. or they are working in the um, in the actual uh, stations mm -hmm. selling mm -hmm. tickets. However, it is going to lead to more people losing their jobs in the end because fewer people will be able to afford to go on trains all the time. They will jump in their cars. Yeah. They will make other arrangements for meeting people. Yeah. So it's a loss leader in the end. And it does annoy me. There are people that are so worried about putting food on their table and they are earning much much less and to me we need to have a bigger picture there are people in the public sector like not just nurses teachers all of the support stuff it doctors as well who have had a pay cut in real terms 
for over 10 years and many of them are struggling financially. When you see this going on, it makes you very annoyed because there are other people that really are struggling and do need to get the support, yeah. in my opinion. Of course. And, you know, if you're travelling to London, uh, whether it's from the home counties or on an intercity train uh, from Leeds, Birmingham, in the morning time during rush hour, you know, it's very, very expensive to travel. And, you know, people need to bear that in mind when it comes to your cost of living, that oh. do you need to make that journey. That's what people are going to start saying to themselves in the very near future is, Absolutely. can I get away with doing a Teams or a Zoom meeting? Instead of paying that fare into the centre of London, I might have to do without meeting my client face to face for the interview. Absolutely. Now, recently I did some work in London. I had to get the train at just before eight o'clock. I had to stand the entire way because the driver hadn't shown up for one of the other trains. So all of the Bose people got onto the train that I was on. And this happens all the time. And you're paying good money to stand for 30 minutes all the way into London. Yeah. I know what you're saying there, Susan, that you're paying top fares. Yes. Customer experience is average to poor, to be putting it politely. I yes. Would say. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're absolutely right about, you know, as a business thinking, oh, goodness me, it will be easier to use um, Teams or Zoom like we're doing now. That will save me in time and also money, money that is off my bottom line as a business. And we've seen within the speaking world, I know that there are more things that are happening face to face, but the reality is that most things are still online. And term, in terms of preparing for Christmas, are the supermarkets, you know, heavily advertising for Christmas, for Halloween, for Guy Fawkes night, uh, because there's pressure on people might say to themselves, I'm going to cut back. Are the supermarkets, the retail sector, are they putting people under pressure through advertising and marketing to open their wallets, open their purses and get out there and spend money? I saw my first Christmas advert mid-October on the television and I screamed, you know, it was, we wish you a Merry Christmas. And you'd think, goodness, it's over two months away. But um, certainly in the United Kingdom, there has been a trend in the last few years for Christmas decorations to appear in August. Now, there's a particular type of upmarket Christmas decoration that they have in places like Liberty, which are very expensive, and they have a whole Christmas section, and they will sell these beautiful ornaments for 20, 30 pounds for a little tiny one. There is a market there, but I haven't, other than that advert, I haven't seen that much. Now, I don't know if that's because retail organizations are thinking, we're going to wait until there is another new prime minister, that there's a new budget, because the budget that they were going to have next Monday has been postponed until mid-November. And whether they are thinking, do you know what, we'll wait until we see hear that and then go for it. True, yeah. And of course, the, in the Bank of England, in your case, We'll be meeting at some stage very shortly and there could be a further increase in interest rates which is going to put more pressure on people who are paying mortgages you know they're going to see an increase in the monthly payment because i don't yeah. see the banks absorbing the hit all the time it's going to be passed yeah. on to consumers and there was actually an article there very recently in the sunday times and the point that was being made was that uh, house prices in the uk uh, are extremely expensive and if interest rates keep going up in the short to medium term you could see pressure on house prices you might see the the housing bubble effectively burst so houses that are worth maybe half a million or a million would go down in price pretty quickly and that's happened before it, been... has, it has happened before i mean i had my first mortgage 
right at the end of the 80s which ages me and my mortgage went up from six percent to sixteen percent and um i remember you, you know you budget for six percent and i remember thinking all i can eat are baked beans and, <laughs> and oh, no. bread. you know i economized for those few months and then it went down again but i do know people um, a couple of parents from my son's primary school who they just could no longer afford to have their flat. And they walked into the estate agent with the keys and said, we cannot do it anymore. Here's the key. You can repossess it, which is heartbreaking. And the trouble now is that because there's been such low interest, I mean, much less than 6%. People have got used to that. True. It's a re and, and some people have got huge mortgages and a huge pressure to earn more to be able to pay for that. And it's um, really, really worrying. Many, many people are very worried about that because they quite rightly bought into the fact oh, I will be able to purchase this property and maybe a fixed mortgage is coming to the end of its five years. Certainly, I can't get onto my mortgage brokers for the flat that I own in London because they're just, I don't know if they've taken the website down or what, but you can't get in. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're saying there that, you know, if people have bought a house in the past two, three, four, five years, and then if there's a substantial correction in house prices, those people are going to find themselves in negative equity very, you know, soon. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, my husband, when, when I married him, he owned a house in Welling Garden City, and that was in negative equity for the first four years of our marriage. And then as soon as it went into positive equity, we moved. But that was the reality for many, many people. And it could become the reality again for more people. I think it, I, I, I hate to say it, yeah. that or even repossessions. I hope not. I really hope not, because that will be more people that are homeless. But, you know. Yeah. And also there's a danger that if, you know, house prices do fall, people are going to come under pressure to sell their property because uh, they might want to say, could say to themselves, it's better to sell now and pay off a mortgage uh, yes. and rent for a while than yes. to continue to pay a mortgage when you don't know which way interest rates are going. So I agree with you. you could find that there's a surplus of houses on the market compared to uh, the demand for people to buy those houses uh, and eventually you get a price correction. So there's a lot of permutations and combinations that are going to play out over the next number of months into next year, I think. What advice would you have for the vulnerable in our society? How can they cope to put food on the, the table over Christmas into the new year and also at the same time manage their electricity bills, gas bills? and cost of living well first of all it's worthwhile seeing where there are they're calling them hot hubs in the united kingdom certainly my local church they're opening up until two o'clock in the afternoon every day and there's going to be coffee and tea lots of people are going to take in cakes and things like that to volunteer nice. and that's for anybody who wants to keep warm during the day. I mean, I know it's only until two o'clock, but that's some help. True. Um, and I think if you can keep your heating off as much as possible, really think about ways that you use electricity as well as gas. True. So, thinking about, um, we've got a slow cooker, which is very efficient, but using the oven, for example, you can, be quite lazy about how you use it. One can, not you, but one can be. Thinking True. about the most efficient way of using that. 
um, switching off lights, all of those things. With regards food, I think that you need to think about how you can cook food that is cheaper. True. Cheaper ingredients. I know the BBC have got um, a number of recipes now that are one pound each. I don't know if that's one pound for a family or one pound per person, but it, immediately it's thinking about how that can be cheaper. Dare I say it, if you are in difficulties, you must go to a food bank and see how you can register to see if you can get some food. Very good idea. Um, people like myself, I, I always donate to food banks every month and have done for quite some time. Maybe if you've got school age children, it would be worthwhile being brave enough because you can feel a little bit worried and embarrassed having a chat with either the secretary or the head teacher to see if there are any ways that you can have some help even if it is that your child could could register for free meals so that you know that they're having a decent meal at lunchtime um those are two things th those are things that i can think of immediately yeah, yeah. This has been a very fascinating conversation today, Susan, and this is why we host the gift show. And what I've taken away from today's conversation is don't be, don't feel ashamed to ask for help. As you correctly said there a minute ago, if you have children in school, it's more important to ensure that they're getting adequate protein and carbohydrates into their system every day. Don't feel ashamed in talking to your headmaster or your year head to ensure your son or daughter is getting a good meal in school. It might be for free, but don't be afraid to ask. There's no shame in doing that. Secondly, think very carefully about your journeys and where you're going to. Do you need to meet that person in face to face? Can you talk to that person or Zoom over Teams? because the cost of fuel is going to the roof. And also here in Ireland, we're paying a lot of money for diesel and petrol currently at the moment, like our UK citizens and friends. So think very carefully about the journeys you're making. Do you have to make that journey? And also think carefully about the small costs, the cup of coffee, the train journey into Dublin or into London, do you need to make that train journey? And then thirdly, if in doubt, look carefully at your expenditure and think very carefully, do you need to put that heat on? Would electric heater do you instead if it's cold during the daytime? Put your heat on at nighttime or first thing in the morning. So just think very carefully before you switch the on switch on your gas or electricity. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the audience before I let you go? Do you know, I wrote loads of things about, um, about running a business and things that you could do to save money. <laughs> I don't know if that would be of interest as well. We put the link into the, the, this video for you, Susan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. OK, talk ahead there. OK, so yeah, I think that we mustn't listen to the press. I, as a matter of routine, as a business owner, I go through my expenses every year. There are always subscriptions, aren't there? There are software subscriptions, um, maybe organisations that you're a member of. I list all of those and then I review them every year to see whether they are giving me value. So only yesterday I had a subscription, um, you know, somebody saying, oh, your membership's coming up. And in two years, I have had no business benefit from it. So I've stopped that subscription. It sounds ruthless, but you have to think about the value. And I do know friends, um, 
possibly you know them as well i won't mention names and that you know they spend two and a half thousand pounds on this network group and five thousand pounds on that and i've said to them what value have you got is this a social thing really or or are you getting business value and it's worthwhile going through all of those because then you can keep your costs down um thinking about your overheads the biggest one is obviously if you've got staff however if you cut staff are you going to be able to deliver the same quality or are you going to compromise that and that could be a loss leader for you i know during the pandemic um there were people that cut back didn't they and, and they used oh because of covid and now it's just as poor you know we we think of banks that you have to spend an hour on the phone waiting to speak to somebody that's not because of covid it's because they cut the staff uh, to try and save money and quite often they use technology to replace people and the customer experience goes down try not to jump it, into that and you've got to continue your business development. This is the time when you've really got to work hard on that rather than hibernating. And other business expenses tend to be things like, well, like fuel and tra transport, but also um, business premises. Do you need the office that you're in? Is it too big? Could you go move somewhere smaller where the rent is less could you renegotiate with your landlord if you don't own it could you switch off lights all of those things could you if you've got a team could you make sure that everybody switches off their computer at the end of the day you know little things like that yeah. there are lots of ways that you could reduce your costs without reducing the quality of your work and what you're saying there, perhaps you might need to look at being more productive. Yes. Letting people go. And that by being more productive, you actually reduce the cost of the labor within your business because your throughput is greater. They're yes. achieving more for the same price. That's probably it, a good way of looking at it. It's a, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because if your staff are already stretched to the capacity anyway, and you get rid of a member of staff, the quality is, is, is going to be impacted long term. Yep. But it's it's sort of setting those, in a way, those targets and expectations of the staff and recognising if really you need an extra person. Because one thing that I've come across with a number of my clients is that they are stretched so much because the people making the decisions are thinking about profit over quality and it will backfire in the end i know what you're saying there that people are very bottom line oriented in their business yes. and if they see profit is under stretch stretch or a strain they decide i'm going to cut cost and one of the costs they often cut is the cost of labor or employee yes. numbers and they make these people redundant on statutory redundancy they get back the redundancy from the government eventually yeah and customer service then suffers for it because the remaining employees are under pressure to to deliver a service they don't have the bandwidth the customer experience suffers for that so i think it's probably better to hold fire and see how the whole you know economic crisis pans out but there is i suppose you could say a tendency in Anglo-American type organizations for the CEO to start trimming out overhead pretty quickly in businesses in order to satisfy the stock markets and to, you know, get the price earning ratio back up again. So there is that element, unfortunately, in business, too, that uh, it's very geared towards satisfying the stock markets, yes. not the consumer at the end of the day. Um, yeah yeah it's it's interesting isn't it um you know certainly in this country um in the united kingdom and northern ireland they have trimmed away any excess in public sector and they are stretched to being broken now 
Yeah. The model in HS, which was for years a well-funded model, is a broken model at the moment. And they're finding it very hard to get uh, young junior doctors to go on the, the general practitioner path. They're trying to find these young GPs or young junior doctors are looking at alternative uh, yeah. routes within the medical profession, for example, or they're heading abroad to yeah. Canada, the States, Australia, where there's much better opportunities for them. And the same is happening here in Ireland, to be quite honest, uh, where you get to say young doctors who've done their internship, they head off to Australia, the States, Canada, and work as SHO, senior house officers in hospitals over there. And they have a much better life work balance and in, some of them are very reluctant to return and some that the few that do actually go back then into the hornet's nest as well you could say because they're back into working long hours uh they're under pressure they're moving around every three or six months to different hospitals and that brings a lot of personal pressure on them so yeah i know what you're saying there that the public services have been back tremendously in the uk over the last number of years um yeah so there's big and pressure there on people as, as certainly with, without naming names um one of my friends her daughter is a doctor and trained up to be a you know hospital doctor ha long hours no flexibility no weekends had to train in her own time and also train others she has just gone and got a medical role within a, a an accountancy firm. She could not believe how much better the conditions are, that in work time, she's able to do her training. And all of her friends who qualified with her, they have done the same thing. They have left the NHS because they spent years getting their training and with appalling conditions and who can blame them in the end it's very true and, and uh, you know <clears throat> i know what you're saying there it is difficult for young doctors to they have to make some very difficult choices yes. because at the end of the day they've studied hard for five or six years they've done their internship you know in the case in the uk it's two years here in ireland it's 12 months minimum but they worked very hard in those years and they have to you know make a life for themselves they're entitled as anybody else is to a reasonable work-life balance absolutely this has been a tremendous conversation today uh susan and it's been a pleasure talking to you and i think the audience is going to go away with a lot of great ideas as to how they can save money put food on the table over the winter spring 2023 and further ahead and also to how they can man manage their electricity and gas bills and keep their heads above water so thank you for being a guest on the gift show today susan thank you very much for having me you're most welcome